For this episode, we take the plane and travel to Ontario. It is the most populous province, but compared with Holland, my homeland, it's almost empty. Ottawa is the capital of Canada, and Toronto is Canada's largest city. One of the most popular attractions are the Niagara Falls, and we can take a ride with a made of mist to feel the magnificent power of so much falling water. And it's hard to believe that there were people brave enough to die from the falls in a barrel or even in a canoe. For me, I prefer a nice, easy-going river like this. And then I had to make a decision what to paint. Another lake, another rock. Well, I discovered that koi fish are really hot in Ontario. So I decided to do something totally different and paint some fish. So here they are, the most colorful fish, the koi. My name is Michael Schutte and thank you for watching Painting the Island. Hello and welcome in my studio. Today we're going to dive into the colorful world of the koi. The koi fish is really popular in Canada, but especially in Ontario. To save some time, I already made a sketch. There's still a lot of things to do, so at work. This is gonna be an interesting challenge. I never did a koi before. Now, now wait a minute, maybe once for a client. So it's gonna be a surprise for me also. Let's start with a dark underground as a foundation for the stone bed because we are gonna paint a lot of stones. I mixed an ultramarine blue with a burnt umber which is almost black and in this case I added a bit of earth green. You hardly see it but it's there. Yes, a very strange combination but it worked it will work out fine. Then with a small filbert brush we can lay a stone with some grey into this dark. It's really a cool wet and wet technique. We add a bit of white to the mix and push it into the dark foundation. The benefit is it will have some shadow right away. But it's not done yet because the stones need some light and texture, but it is a very interesting technique and keep in mind that the light is coming in this case from the left. If you ever looked into a river, you might have noticed that stones have all kinds of colors. Grays, reds, black, well, everything is possible. In this subject, we will use gray and ochre tones. So, if we mix yellow ochre, elizabeth crimson and titanium white, we can make a great combination of these wonderful tones. In the grey is always some ochre, and in the ochre tones is always some grey. We can even add some reds and blues, but in this case I would leave the sparkling colors like reds and orange to the fish. The soft grey tones will make a perfect balanced background for all the super colorful fish. Let's keep this in mind. Let's paint a big stone. There are big and small tones, stones everywhere and I prefer to do the big guys a little bit along the side of the painting and maybe in the corners. And look what happens. Out of the nothing, all kind of cool stones appear, appear to the surface. Isn't that a fantastic technique? I remember that the famous artist Michelangelo said the statue is already in the stones. I only have to get it out of the stone. Well, we painters can say the same. The stones are already in your canvas. We only have to get it 
out of there. Isn't that funny? Well, we shall see if we can do this. And we can. Just keep on going and we will have a lovely stone bed for the river we create for this ancient fish. Yes, super ancient. That is what the koi is. It is 20 million years old. So compared with the first humans who appeared 3 million years ago, we are a bunch of rookies. And if you don't believe it, let me introduce Lucy, the oldest girl in the world. She lived in Ethiopia at Adar in the Awash Valley. She lived in this valley 3.2 million years ago and probably raised a family in a cozy little cave. The members of the expedition who found her were beetle fans and played and sang loudly Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds at the campfire. So the skeleton was named Lucy. And here she is, in bits and pieces, but after some restructuring work she must have looked like this. And sorry, it's not very decent, but 3 million years ago people were not so picky. And yes, Lucy became famous. She started touring in 2007 for 6 years and performed through all the USA. The exhibition was called Lucy's Legacy, the hidden treasures of Ethiopia. Lucy returned to Ethiopia in 2013 and you still can visit her in the National Museum of Ethiopia. One more photo for the fans and let's return to our stonework. And stonework we have, we have a lot. I can paint probably another 20 hours of stones. But it's fun to do and very rewarding. And I guarantee that after this painting you will be a specialist in painting stones. So remember the technique. First we make a wet underlayer with black and a bit of green. And then we press the grey tones into that wet foundation. Then we start adding light and dark tones and with a fan brush we can add all kinds of stuff what's growing on stones. An everlasting curse is the glittering of the studio lights into the wet dark paint. Really I tried everything, like Letting lean my canvas over in a 20% degree curve on my easel, I changed my lights, but nothing works. So sorry, we have to live with this bothering glittering, but it will be short. And we move on building up the stone bed. And actually, stone beds are in nature's artwork. I can sit for hours at a mountain creek and look what happens in the swallow waters, in particular when the sun is shining right on it. It's almost magic. The color prints on the stones are absolutely fascinating and are created by coming down the mountain and following their eternal voyage down the stream. And if you hold a piece of stone in your hand, look at the patterns who are created maybe a thousand years ago. I will skip this part of painting the wet underlayer and suddenly I found a way to get rid of the glittering lamps. I put the whole canvas lower on the easel. How simple can it be? But it worked. And we continue pushing the paint into the wet foundation and we create one stone after another. The trick is to make them uneven. And I mean small, big and maybe some gravel in between and use different colors too. We're not going to use the bright colors like reds and blues because our fishy friends they will get the main colors. So we continue to use for the background stones soft tones like gray, black and a bit of ochre. And watch my technique. I hold a small filbert brush flat and push it in the wet under layer. That is so important. 
we start with dark and give it some light on the left side of the stones as the light is coming from the left. On top, I give it a touch of highlight. And if you ever need help with these techniques, you're always welcome to come by in Qualicum Beach. I can imagine that it's pretty hard to do this, but my advice is to buy a paper oil block. These paper sheets are prepared for oil paint. And I would start practicing on this before you do the real thing on your canvas. Lucky enough, oil paint is very forgiving. If you make a mistake, you can always go over it again and again. And oil paint is a very friendly, non-poisonous paint based on grained plants and linseed oil. And if you don't like the mediums to make the paint smooth, you can use a simple walnut oil. Very nature friendly stuff, no smell and easy to handle. In the meantime, we continue to make the background layer, which is stones, stones and more stones. We make them in all sizes and colors and above all in different shapes. We don't want to make them too bright. The plan is to keep it all in the soft tones, otherwise the fish won't pop out anymore. And we have to keep in mind that the koi are the lead role players in our story. So we need a soft tone background for them to swim in. And of course we can make differences in light and dark, but not too overwhelming. Anyway, I will show you later what I mean. It's going to be an interesting painting. Don't forget to do a few highlights on the corner of the stones. But again, not too bright, we keep it all pretty mellow. And it's a good idea to keep the corners covered with big stones. And we keep them pretty light. So we can use a combination of light grey tones and maybe some light ochre tones. And with ochre tones, remember, I mean ochre and lines and crimson and white. Round the base, we can keep it pretty dark for the shadow. Remember, the light is coming from the left. So the right sides of the stones pick up the shadow. And maybe a little bit more light on the left side, and I think this is all done. Then, if you're happy with all your stones, we can give them some decoration with the fan brush. On one side, we can do a lighter ochre tone, and on the other side, we can do a darker grey tone. Stones who lie in the water always gather mosses, mold or maybe little shellfish or whatever swims in the river and ponds. It makes it all so very interesting for us painters and you can fantasize endlessly about what's going on there. But yes, there's always a but, I strongly advise to gather reference photos from underwater scenes. Or go to a creek, a pond or a river in a neighborhood and make some photos. And if you don't have a river around, go to Google Pictures and look for stone beds in rivers. You will find something. And we keep on going with decorating the little stones too. And I might say that it works out best when you do this wet in wet. It enhances the overall painting and makes it more natural. It only needs a bit of patience. But we painters, we are a patient breed. Otherwise, you never had started painting. Let's do one more big stone here in the corner and then we will move on to the top end. We will give this stone a few effects with light and dark and I think that will be enough for now. Let's move up to the top. And we can do the same technique like we did. We start with the dark and work our way up to the light. And how easy can it be? I strongly recommend that you take little pieces of the canvas one by one. If you go all over the place, the paint will be dry if you return and the wet and wet technique will have no result. Let's do another big ugly stone at the top. 
and is more ochre than the others, but all these big stones will serve as a kind of frame for the whole painting. It will enhance the deep and deep effect, or let me tell you this in a different way, it will enhance the 3D effect, effect as we look into the painting. I'm going to show you something else. We're going to make a lot of small little blinking gravel. After that, I will cut it off and paint the rest of the stones off camera because you are already watching me painting stones for almost half an hour. And we don't want you to get nightmares about stones. Okay, I took a small round brush and with my hand leaning on the stick, I push little pieces of gravel in between the stones, which is really a wonderful effect. Right under the koi, we're gonna paint a big stone because I want a steady background under the fish. Not too dark, not too light, just a bit in between. So we use the gray basic tone and for a shadow we use the dark tone as we used for the underlayer, a dark gray. With soft movements we make circle brush strokes till it melts away in the gray. And it might be good to make a shadow under the fin and on top we give it some highlights. We do a few more gravels in between the stones and put up a few light tones for the wet effect. With a fan brush we can add more natural decos as we did before on the other stones. Just use a bit of grey, a bit of ochre till you think it's enough. And on the left side we give it a bit more light. Keep in mind the light is coming from the left. Let's not forget to decorate the big yellow ugly stone at the top. With a fan brush we can dip in some cool decos with ochre and grey tones and it's really it's all kinds of stuff what's growing under the water. But admit it, he looks way much better. I love to decorate stones with all kinds of stuff. The possibilities are endless so use your fantasy. Behind the ugly yellow stone I want the water to look more deeper. So we keep the overall tone dark. Pretend that the left part of the painting is an upgoing part in the river or maybe the pond and maybe this whole right part is deeper and so darker. So we start again with a dark foundation and do the same trick for the smaller stones but we keep the overall tones darker. The fish in the front will have bright colors, so that's why we keep this part of the background pretty dark. However, we have to play a bit with light, also to keep up the 3D feeling of the stones. We simply press the paint into the wet background and there is another stone. And take care that we make it different in sizes and colors. Remember evenness is the biggest enemy of us painters. Another cool trick is an air bubble on the surface, floating on the surface. With a light grey and a very small round brush we can paint very small <laughs> bubbles. Most of the time one big bubble and a few surrounding smaller ones and the highlight is in the middle. And we can repeat that a few times. Later we can add more green stuff and maybe a water lily. For now let's paint a few more stones and let's see how it all will work out. We can use some different colors and add on top of it some highlight. For now we leave the stones alone because it will take another 4 or 5 hours of stone painting to complete the background. So like I said before I will do this off camera otherwise this is going to be a really boring episode and we don't want that. So from now we dive into the fishy stuff starting with the lowest koi. You will get some interesting red and dark colors and you know the number one rule for us painters we work from the back to the front. 
when you start with the koi, you will discover that it is a complicated fishy guy. We start with lips in a soft gray with a touch of an ogre tone, and on his nose he gets some black spots. And we try to paint his eyelids as good as possible, but we have to guess a bit where they are. These fish are huge. They can grow up to a meter, so that will be around, let's say, 40 inch. Sorry, I don't get those inches into my head. I keep on counting in centimeters and meters. But that is what you get when you grow up in Amsterdam. We slowly go into the reds. Because this fish has a lot of red. We can use cadmium red. And for the shadow effect we put some alizum crimson into the color. However, the problem with reds is that they are very transparent. So I hate to say this, but it might need two or even better, three layers. So you understand that this is not a painting for the impatient persons. But, I said it before, we painters are a patient breed. The fun part is that you can be really creative with these colorful fishies. It doesn't really matter if there's a spot too much or too less. But, there is a certain rhythm. There is a certain rhythm into these colors, so keep the right balance. So my advice is, gather a lot of reference photos, maybe from Google Pictures or whatever. Lucky enough, I had a friend, his name is Doc Hiramoto, and I had his permission to take tons of photos of his koi carps. Yes, he is Japanese too, and above all, an excellent, super friendly doctor. And I'm not allowed to make any advertisements, so that is all I can say about it. But seeing the real thing is always better than looking only to photos. So maybe you can visit a hatchery who sells koi, or find a pond with koi. They are everywhere. I didn't know they were so super popular here in Canada. And we, we continue to push the red into the cotton. And see how I hold the brush. I scrape it sideways over the surface using a lot of paint. Into the red we put a bunch of black decos and like I said try to keep up the balance. The fins are super transparent so we start with a grey tone and bring in some light stripes and then a few dark tones and with a soft brush we can blend it all in. For now we leave it like it is and start with the other fin. Later we will come back and add some effects. And it's the same technique, but we have to draw it a tiny bit shorter as we're looking at a fish on a kind of three-quarter corner. And it's time for us to take a little break. Let's visit the Niagara Falls. One of my favorite places in Ontario are the Niagara Falls. I've been standing and watching there for hours. The force of the water blows me away and I must not think to fall in this roaring inferno. Not many people know that since 1850 more than 5000 people have gone over the falls, either intentionally or accidentally. The first recorded person to survive going over the falls was school teacher Annie Edson Taylor, who successfully completed the stunt inside an oak barrel. She must have been a sturdy lady. And she did it to gain fame and money, and she survived. Another daredevil was Bobby Leach. Here he is sitting on his barrel and he jumped in 1911, July 25. He survived, but spent six months in hospital, recovering from injuries he sustained from the fall, which included a fractured jaw and two broken knee caps. So no, we cannot call this waterfall jumping a healthy sport. Honestly, if you stand aside of the falls, 
and look at this majestic water power, you cannot understand how somebody has the courage to jump in this hellhole. But they kept on coming one after another. And before you get any ideas from the 5,000 people who went over the rim, only 16 survived. More or less. Limping and broken the rest of their life. However, in 1951, the famous daredevil Red Hill jumped over the rim in this barrel. And he was shattered to pieces by the water and rocks. Not a pleasant duty for the rangers to clean it all up and gather all the parts. For Ontario Premier Leslie Frost, this was the end of it. He said enough is enough and he issued an order to arrest everyone found to be performing stunts at the falls. And if you were caught, you had to pay $33,000 fine, a lot of money in the 50s. So that was the end of it. However, so now and then a car or a ship goes over the edge. But those are accidents. So after all, it's better to admire the beauty and stay away from the edge. Much safer. Yes, a good challenge is okay, but it has its limits. I was there years ago when life was still simple and easy. And what nobody knows is that there is a beautiful flower garden or park right beside the falls. Just a little holiday tip. And like I said before, off camera I painted the last part of the stones to save you a few hours of stone painting watching. In the meantime I am working on the lower koi and give it a second layer especially over the reds. Red pigments are always a problem because they just don't cover right away. It might be working after two or three or even four layers. So yes, it is a lot of work. We keep the fins very transparent and further ahead I will show you again how we can set this up. And there is a little tiny fin, fin under his body. So let's paint that first bit of grey under layer and we can go over it with lighter lines following the direction of the fin or shape. It can be a bit tricky but with some practice you can do it. And by the way, I said this before already a few times, these episodes are not commercial tutorials. No, I do this as a volunteer. I think already for seven years, yes, time flies. And I might say with lots of pleasure. It will give you an impression of what you can do with wet in wet oil paint or acrylics, that's possible too. With acrylics, you might use retarder to keep it longer smooth and maybe a good acrylics medium. That's really important really important. And with these episodes I like to support the North Island Wildlife Recovery Center in Ericton. This summer we will do some new filming over there and I got some cool plans. And if you need more advice you are always welcome to hop in and I'll be happy to help you. And for the rest I add a lot of pleasant information about all the provinces we will visit this year in our grand tour over Canada. And I know it's named Painting the Island with Michael Schutte, but it's fun to spread our wings and fly over Canada with lots of interesting subjects. Next time we will choose one of the maritime provinces, like Nova Scotia or maybe Prince Edward Island, very interesting places with lots of history like Ontario. In the meantime I gave the koi a mid fin with a grey tone. A middle grey tone. Not too dark, not too light. And over then I painted a few light effects with a light ochre tone. And let's not forget the lower part of his tail. It's hidden beneath everything but it's there. 
We can do this with cadmium red and a bit of alizon crimson for the dark parts. The tail is grayish and the inside get a good deal of black, but it's still transparent. On top we give it a highlight of a light ochre tone and on the tail itself a few black decals. Actually the koi is a very creative fish. You can decorate it whatever you want. It's time for a little break because I want to show you some of our artwork. Relax and have fun. And this is the place where all the creativity happens. Our beautiful studios in Qualicum Beach. I teach their music and art and my wife Els card making and scrapbooking. I would love to show you my paintings just to get some inspiration. And I understand that for a lot of you Qualicum Beach is not next door. But if you happen to be on Vancouver Island, just hop in for a chat and take a look around. And of course you are always welcome if you need some advice about materials, maybe color mixing or whatever you want to know about art and music. My sweet wife Els is a magician with paper and she shows a great selection of scrapbooking and paper art. And don't forget that we offer a wide range of causes in music painting, scrapbooking and card making. Yes, there is a whole new world, a whole new creative world for you right at your fingertips. Our steady viewers might know by now that I love to support the North Island Wildlife Recovery Center in Arrington with my paintings. This place, founded by Sylvia and Robin Campbell, is a lovely retreat for wounded birds and other animals who need recovery and help. Also a lovely place for inspiration. So if you ever visit the island, take a look in the center and admire all the wonders of nature. Enjoy! Yes, a very inspirational place. And certainly this summer we will visit the center again and see if there's some cute animal who wants a portrait of itself. We shall see. When we paint the middle koi, we best start with the right fin in a soft grey. Now the underlayer body is still wet, which is a bit tricky, but as fins are transparent, it's good that a bit of the red paint is visible in the fin. Now this might be a bit complicated and tricky, but if you do it without any pressure, it will work. Otherwise, just wait till it's dry and then go over it. We paint the body of the koi with a foundation of grays and ochre tones before we start with the dark tones. And yes, this is gonna be fun. We give him a lot of black spots like the Dutch cows. I gave him a bit of an extra dark because I want to cover his body as soon as possible. But we have to wait how it works out. It depends a bit how it dries up. And maybe you know that oil paint shrinks a bit when it dries and it is transparent, which is a blessing and a curse. The Dutch masters took advantage of this transparency technique and gave their paintings several layers or washes. So they mixed the colors on the canvas and this technique became really famous by the godfather of the Amsterdam painters Rembrandt. If you study his paintings you will see colors which he only could obtain by using this layer technique. Actually, it's almost a pre-digital painting technique, which we do now with digital drawing boards. It might be a good idea to take a look in the Amsterdam Rijksmuseum. You can take a virtual tour through all the different rooms and study the paintings you like in your own pace. 
it is so realistic that it looks like if you really dare, you don't have to stand in line, there's no rush, and you're all by yourself. And not to forget, it saves you an expensive flying trip. In the meantime, we build up the black and white fish and we lighten up the ribs of the fins with a very light ochre tone, almost highlight. And if we study how a fin is built up, you will be surprised what a nature wonder of technology it actually is. I say it often, nature is, an, is the greatest master of all, and these carps are living masterpieces of art, colorful and gracious. We can make the black decos a bit stronger by giving them a second layer. It sounds strange, but even pure black is also transparent. The trick is to add a bit of burnt sienna to the mix to take the transparency away. That works great by doing trees, but in this case it's better to be patient and give it a second or even a third layer. The tails of these guys are always a challenge. They are on the move in a very folded way. They overlap each other all the time. So we have to choose a certain position and just make the best of it. We start with a middle tone grey, bring in some dark tones from the bottom and strike it into the wet tail. Then the decoration starts and we can lighten up the ribs with a light ochre tone and at the end even a highlight. When I was studying koi for this episode, I discovered the oldest fish in the world, named Hanako, which means flower girl. She was born in the year 1751. And how do we know this? Well, around 1966, two of her scales were removed and examined very extensively. It appeared that they must have been at least 216 years old. So she lived for another 10 years and passed away in 1977 under the loving care of Dr. Kome Koshiara. Now can you imagine that this fish survived Napoleon Bonaparte who was born in 1769 and all the big wars and events of that time slot. She must have had a fantastic life and we will never know how much she remembered of at least nine generations of caretakers. The normal lifespan of a koi is around 40 years, so we might say this was a very special koi. I must say that extremes in the animal world are always fascinating me. And I never knew that a fish can be so old. I knew that kakapo parrots can live an 80 years, and if you dive into it, you will be surprised. Tortoise turtles can live 150 years, but it is said they can reach also 500 years, but that is never proven. However, in the Guinness Book of World Records, you will find turtle Jonathan, who is 190 years old and still kicking around. So Hanako gets competition. Jonathan lives very comfortably on the island of St. Helena, a British overseas territory in the South Atlantic Ocean. So the air is probably very healthy in the water too. Okay, I admit I was carried away. I promise we will continue now, otherwise we are still painting koi till it's Christmas. But comparing with all these lifetime champions, we humans are a bit pitiful breed. But okay, we make the best of it. In the meantime, we started the third koi. He is on top of everything, so he probably will catch the eye of the viewer. The technique is about the same as the others. 
We started with soft grey tones and moved slowly into the reds. And we know it by now, the reds don't cover because it's very transparent. But it doesn't matter, we give them another layer when it's dry. And now we continue bringing up the colors and I push the bristles sidewards on the fresh cotton. Which is now the best technique. Just shake the brush and the paint will attach quicker to the surface. I always advise buy the best canvas you can afford and don't paint on greasy floppy canvases. The joy of cheap will disappear soon when you struggle with painting and the paint doesn't attach on the cotton. The black tones have the same transparency problems as the red. But for now we take it like it is and move forward. There are different color koi fish, but I fell for the black and white and the red ones. As a follower of the Dutch masters who used more grey and earth tones, I found it really refreshing to use some primary fresh red tones for a change. We just let it dry for a couple of days and go over it again. Now let's do the fins and by now you know what to do. But I repeat it anyway, because you might remember, repeat is the golden key of learning. So we set it up with a middle grey, put up the ribs with a light ochre tone and from the heart we blend in some dark tones. Or we might say the black tones. Just give it a few strokes right into the wet paint right from the body, almost no pressure. For now we can leave it drying and come back again to give it the finishing touch. We give it a few lines here and there, we blend it in if possible and on top of the fins maybe a few highlights. And then there is that tail, the painter's nightmare. I mentioned it before, it's almost surrealistic. But we do the same technique and we go on with the grey tones and the ochre tones and maybe on top a highlight. And here I made a nice mistake, I gave it a black stroke but that was not a good idea. The paint is too wet and it ends up like grey. So like I said, we let this part drying. And we'll continue with the tail. We continue with some light and paint the ribs as good as we can. Now we'll see what I can do. This corner is extra tricky as I paint in a strange wriggle because the camera is leaning over my shoulder. And this canvas is huge, almost 40 inches width. But the good thing is that we have space for our fish. And while the fish are drying and waiting for another layer, we will start the water lily. I made off camera a foundation in the wet underlayer and now we make it wet again using a square brush and a dark green. We move the bristles from the outside to the inside which gives a very natural brush stroke. Slowly we bring in some lighter colors, some lighter greens and we make the edges much more lighter to give the impression that they curl up a bit. Close to the light edge we can use a dark green with maybe a dark ochre tone to create a kind of shadow effect and then we're gonna blend it in very softly to make it smooth and wet. From the inside out we can do a few darker brush strokes and we have a floating lily. On the water are always a few bubbles floating. We can do this with a very light bluish grey and we use a small round brush. We're almost there. Another effect what I love to use is little weeds in between and on the stones. We start with a very dark green and on the top a very light, maybe even an ochre tone to cheer it up. 
And slowly we come to the end of this painting. I will give it another few layers to cover the reds and the greens and maybe the blacks. And I think we have done enough for now. In a few moments you will see the end result. Make one of yourself and don't forget to have fun. During this episode we went to a lot of history. We painted the koi and by now you know how to paint stones and we had a lot of fun together. Check out our website, till the next time and keep on painting!